Today on Larry King Now, my interview with astronaut Scott Kelly aboard the International Space Station on Life in Space. We get up at about 6 or 7 in the morning, Greenwich time, so the time that uh, a lot of Europe is on. And then we go to sleep at uh, 10 to 11 o'clock at night, again on that uh, European time. And that's a good compromise uh, because we have a bunch of different control centers around the world that, uh, that we interact with. On his mission. An experiment to see how well we could grow food in space. You know, if we want to go to Mars someday and, uh, you know, live and work in places that don't have the type of resupply we get uh, on the space station, we're going to have to know how to do that. Plus been trying to rewatch at least Chell Lindgren and I uh, with uh, rewatching Breaking Bad and uh, you know exposing our Japanese colleague uh, to it all next on Larry King now Welcome to Larry King Now. Since its launch over 16 years ago, the International Space Station, a habitable artificial satellite in low Earth orbit, has served as a scientific research lab traveling at 17,000 miles an hour. Astronaut Scott Kelly is 145 days into a year-long mission aboard the space station. When the mission's completed, It'll be the longest stretch of time any U.S. astronaut has spent in space. And according to NASA, the research being done on this mission will provide far-reaching and long-lasting benefits for not only our space program, but for all humanity. Recently, I was able to speak with Kelly as he continues his mission 250 miles above the Earth. Station, this is Larry King. How do you hear me? I hear you good, sir. How do you hear me? I hear you fine. Stop with the sir, Scott. Call me Larry. <laughs> you you orbit the Earth sixteen times a day. Where, where are you got? Where are you guys right now? You know, I I was just looking at it, and then uh, something came up here. We are um, we are right over Australia, and it's the uh, the middle of the night there right now. What, what, Scott, is your average day like? Do you live like, <clears throat> do you work like on Eastern time to get up at 8 o'clock? Do you work all day, sleep at 11 p.m.? What's your day like? So we, uh, we work on uh, most of the time, almost all the time, on, on Greenwich Mean Time. So we get up at about 6 or 7 in the morning Greenwich time, so the time that uh, a lot of Europe is on. And then we go to sleep at uh, 10 to 11 o'clock at night again on that uh, European time. And that's a good compromise uh, because we have a bunch of different control centers around the world that, uh, that we interact with in Moscow, Japan, uh, the U.S., in uh, Germany, Huntsville, Alabama. So being on that Greenwich time was probably the best compromise we could have. How many are on the ship right now? Well, right now there are six of us. There are uh, three Russian cosmonauts, a, uh, an astronaut from Japan, and uh, two American astronauts, obviously, you know, one of those being myself. And in uh, two weeks from today, we're going to get uh, three more people on board, a, uh, another Russian, a, a Kazakh, and, uh, and a uh, first astronaut from Denmark. So it's, uh, we're going to be pretty full here. Everybody get along well? Yeah, we get along great. Um, you know, this is an international program. It's one of the great things about this uh, this space station program is that it was done with a uh, very strong international partnership. Um, you know, although we have, you know, the, the U.S., what's called the U.S. operational segment, which uh, is the U.S. and our other uh, international partners, and then the Russian segment. So we uh, do work uh, some of the time independently, but we have, you know, two of the Russian cosmonauts doing some medical tests here right now in the U.S. laboratory module, and we share just about any, everything. And they're, uh, you know, the cosmonauts and the other inter international astronauts are, are great friends and uh, great partners for us. You, you've got a, you're up there 145 days, you're going to be up 356. What's the physical toll on you? You know, um, we have a good exercise program up here. Uh, so overall, physically, uh, at least the stuff I can, uh, you know, I can see and how I feel is, uh, is pretty good. 
You know, but part of the reason why we're up here for, for so long is we're studying other things, the things you can't see, like uh, bone loss, the effects on, uh, on our vision, the effects of, you know, in the case of this study with my brother and I, the, the effects of radiation on us at a, a, a genetic level. So, you know, even though I've been up here for a long time, I'll be up here for, uh, you know, a little while longer. I feel good. But, uh, you know, there are other effects that we need to, to, to study as I go along and, uh, and continue to study when I get back. It'll be interesting to check you and your brother out, won't it, since you're identical twins? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a good op opportunity on a kind of an anecdotal level, you know, when you only have one sample group uh, to get some information on, on areas that perhaps need investigating further. You know, as identical twins, our genetics are almost identical, and there are uh, impacts on us from this uh, microgravity environment and the, uh, the radiation environment on us at a, a genetic level. So hopefully we'll learn things uh, uh, about those effects that we can then uh, study even further. Uh, you recently participated in, a, <clears throat> understand, a new first for space travel. What is VEG or VEG-1? Oh, the it's a the uh, the veggie experiment was a uh, an experiment to see how well we could grow food in space, and uh, we'd done that before up here, uh, but in this case we were allowed to eat some of it. So uh, the last time we did it, all of the, the the vegetables went to the ground, and this time we were allowed to eat uh, half of it. And that was great. It, uh, you know, tasted good. It's great to have fresh vegetables. And, you know, if we want to go to Mars someday and, uh, you know, live and work in places that don't have the type of resupply we get uh, on the space station, we're going to have to know how to do that. How, how do experiments that you conduct affect us here on Earth? So we have, uh, you know, over 400 different experiments going on here throughout the year I'm here. And some of those are experiments that... Uh, you know, look at ways uh, to allow us to explore further uh, from the Earth. But some of them do are, probably about 30% of them are, are ways to improve life on Earth. For instance, we recently had a, uh, a bunch of rodents uh, up here where we were doing some experiments that were, would be uh, potentially uh, critical to designing some new drugs for certain type of diseases like uh, you know, bone loss and, and uh, muscle wasting mm. uh, kind of diseases. There are some other drugs that have been developed based on space station research. Uh, tomorrow we got some combustion uh, experiments going on in the U.S. laboratory module that are, uh, you know, looking at ways to improve combustion efficiency. Um, you know, but I like to think, you know, the space program and how it's, uh, you know, allowed us to, uh, you know, improve our ability to uh, fly satellites into orbit and uh, communicate with space vehicles. If you look at how we live our lives today, uh, most of, of what we do from a technology standpoint relies on, you know, space-based technology. You recently urged lawmakers to restore full funding to NASA's commercial crew program. Is that going to be a problem? Well, you know, you know, it's... Uh, I guess it's the president's job to, uh, you know, offer a budget and, uh, and Congress uh, approves it or, or, or doesn't or changes it. Um, you know, for, for us, we need a certain amount of money to, to fly, uh, you know, these commercial crew vehicles on a certain schedule. And, uh, you know, if we don't get the, uh, the amount of money we're asking for, we're probably not going to be able to meet that schedule, which means, you know, for the space station program, we're going to have to you know, further our contract with the Russians uh, to get crews uh, up here. So I don't, I don't know if it'll happen. I hope it happens. I hope we get the, the money uh, we need so we can, you know, continue to, to build two, uh, two vehicles and uh, do it on the schedule that, that we need to support um, our exploration goals. Are you working all the time? You know, we work a lot up here. We work probably from, uh, you know, the time we wake up where we're kind of looking at our schedule throughout the, you know, see what we're going to do that day and doing any uh, uh, preparation for some of the activities we have to do. And then, you know, at night, it's kind of like when a lot of people go home, you know, they check their email. But our work day goes from probably about 7 in the morning until 7 in the evening. And then with a few hours for some, uh, you know, kind of offline email type activities, pretty soon it's time to go to sleep. What kind of fun do you have? 
You know, we, uh, yeah, we watch movies, we watch television shows. Recently, you know, we're been trying to rewatch at least Chell Lindgren and I uh, with uh, rewatching Breaking Bad and, uh, you know, exposing our Japanese colleague uh, to it. Um, and he's enjoying it, actually. But, uh, yeah, we watch some television shows, read books, watch movies, uh, watch the movies generally like one time on the weekend. Uh, all six of us will get together and watch a movie. Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your service to this country. Best of luck in the rest of the mission. And my pleasure, sir. Thank you. Up next, two scientists from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory will join me to further discuss space station missions. We'll talk about NASA's recent discovery of a new planet that they're calling Earth's cousin. Stay with us. Joining us now are two scientists with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Dr. Anita Sengupta is project manager for JPL's Cold Atom Laboratory. And Dr. Nick Siegler, return visit, is the program chief technologist for NASA's Expo Planet Exploration Program. Anita, you're working on a project that's going to be at the space station in a year. In about a year and a half. What yeah. is that? So the name of our mission is the Cold Atom Laboratory. It's actually a facility which can be installed inside of Space Station. It's an atomic physics facility. And so it's going to look at trying to understand some of the fundamental physics questions, such as what is gravity? Are you going to go up and install it? <laughs> We're not going to, unfortunately. But one of our astronaut uh, crew will definitely do that. Is Einstein the hero of all of this? Yes, and so what's interesting is that Bowen's Einstein condensate is another state of matter, and it's the state of matter which was proposed by Einstein many, many years ago, and it was only able to be developed in the laboratory after the invention of lasers. And so by using a technique called laser cooling, you can actually get down matter to temperatures just above absolute zero, which seems a little bit counterintuitive that you fire lasers or something that actually gets really cold. How will we gain from this? We'll understand um, how to perhaps make something called atom lasers. Most people are familiar with a photon-based laser, so you can actually make a, an atom laser by having a coherent beam of atoms. And it also serves another purpose, which is very high-precision uh, clocks or inertial sensors, which can be used for trajectory purposes or um, improved targeting. Forgive me for being stupid, but gravity, I hate to break it to you, is <sighs> what goes up must come down. That's gravity, right? It's a big deal. So it's true. What do we? <laughs> we know what gravity is. Well, the interesting Newton, thing is the that the apple fell. So people don't really know what gravity is. So what's interesting is that people have a theory which explains many of the different um, fundamental forces in nature, and that's compatible with quantum mechanics. But gravity is actually not compatible with quantum mechanics. So this will actually help to hopefully answer that. So question. it's there, but we don't know why. That's correct. Yes. Nick, you're heading NASA's search for exoplanet discovery. What? What is exoplanet? So an exoplanet, um, exo, exoplanet. Exo is Greek for outside. So exoplanet means planets outside of our own solar system. How are you going to find them? Well, we've been finding them for, well, actually, this is the 20th anniversary of the first discovery of the first exoplanet. There are multiple techniques. The one that is most in the news right now is thanks to a NASA space telescope called Kepler. And Kepler, if you remember from my last visit, stares at a bunch of stars, hoping for the serendipitous passing of a planet right across the face of the star. Its brightness dips a little bit while the, the planet passes and then returns once the planet is out of the way. We notice that happens time and time again, and voila, we conclude that we've discovered an exoplanet. Can you guess how many planets are out there? You know, we're getting closer. Thanks to Kepler, we now know, and this is a remarkable discovery, that when you look up in the night sky, practically every single star that you see has at least one exoplanet, if not a system of exoplanets. So if you figure there's a hundred billion or a few hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and if each one of them has at least one exoplanet, that's a few hundred billion exoplanets in our galaxy alone. You make me feel like nothing. <laughs> up next, what the latest with the Mars rover? What's the latest with the Mars rover? I'll ask Dr. Siegel about NASA's most recent discovery on Earth-like an Earth-like planet. This should be interesting. You don't want to miss this. We're back with Drs. Sengupta and Siegler, both with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I'm fascinated. Why did you choose this field of study? 
Oh, in terms of working for NASA? Yeah, why did you want to be in, you're a physicist, right? Well, so um, my background is in aerospace engineering, but my specialty in terms of my PhD research was in plasma physics. Why? Uh, I've always been fascinated in space exploration since I was a small child. I used to watch reruns of Star Trek and Doctor Who <laughs> with my dad. And so I always knew I wanted to be part of the space program. So for me growing up, it was choosing between whether I did astrophysics or aerospace engineering or mechanical engineering. And I why did engineering. you, why did you choose it, Nick? Carl Sagan, Star well. Trek, Isaac Asimov. Knew him well. Yes. Interviewed both of them many times. Nick, NASA made news recently with a planet that some say is Earth's cousin. What, what, what is that? Kepler 452b. So Kepler 452b and Is there a 451a? It is, and that's the star. <laughs> Aha! So 452 is the star. Okay. So the planet and the star together are the closest analog to our own Earth and Sun system. The 452b is just a little bit larger than our own Earth. It orbits a, st a star that is almost identical to our sun. The amount of time that it takes to make one pass around the star is within 20 days of our own year. And most importantly, this planet is at a distance where it's not too hot, so water vaporizes, or too far away where water turns into ice. It's just right, just like here on Earth, well, where water can flow. It could be Earth's brother. Well, the reason it's a cousin and not a twin is the fact that this planet is about 60% larger than our own Earth. That might make a difference. Does it have water? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. But if it had water, and we think that most planets do, it would be actually able to flow in pools of oceans and, and lakes. Why isn't this the biggest story of the year? Well, I think for those that are interested in this field, I think they're very excited about this. I think it's still percolating in the consciousness of of, of, its, of its discovery. But I'll point out that there have been 11 other planets very similar to, in size to this discovery. But what makes this one extra special is the fact that it's orbiting around a star very similar to our own sun. Will our children see expo, exoplanets? Larry, they can go to the internet right now and download pictures of exoplanets. What few people actually know is we've been taking direct images of exoplanets now for, for over a decade. What makes them perhaps a little less interesting is the fact that they tend to be very large, gaseous, giant planets. They're young, they're very bright, and we have imaged them directly. What we haven't done is imaged planets very similar to the Earth. That's really hard to do, and that's what my team is, is working on. How do you explain the Earth? How did we get to be us? Well, how serendipity for an answer, right? We, we think there's a lot of Earths, and we think, I'll, I'll speak for myself, I think there's a lot of life out there. We just haven't developed the technology to find them yet. Anita, you think there's a lot of Earths? I think so. I think it's probably more probable that there are many other Earth-like planets probably with some type of life on them than not. Now, you worked on the Mars rover mission. It's the three-year anniversary. How's it doing? What's it doing up there? Mm -hmm. It's doing really well. And so my role in the mission was actually helping to land the rover on the surface of the planet. Um, so the entry, descent, and landing system for that. Um, and so our payload was essentially the rover, which is this massive car-sized robotic geologist. Mm -hmm. And so its primary mission was to determine, or is to determine, whether or not Mars could have been habitable. And three years later, we've corrected tons and tons of data. Um, the data shows that it has the building blocks of life from an elemental compound perspective. It landed in a location which was an ancient stream bed where many, many millions of years ago, water was actually about knee deep and we've also made measurements of what the radiation levels are on the surface. How long did it take to get there? Uh, it takes about um, six to nine months depending on the trajectory. Is it true there are a group of people planning to go there and live the rest of their life on Mars? <laughs> I think there's some plan for that out there in sort of the commercial sector and then hopefully in terms of NASA and governments getting together we do that within the next you know 15 to 50 years. Would you go to Mars? <laughs> um, I think I would if uh, the technologies were safe. And, and they uh, couldn't bring you back would you go? Um, I probably, I don't think that that architecture makes much sense, uh, so I think probably that wouldn't happen. I think we would always have an architecture where they could bring you back. You think we'll see a manned mission to Mars? I think so. It's, it's, it's part of NASA's uh, long-term plans, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's our human destiny. What's the biggest obstacle? Uh, technology. So the systems that we land robots on the surface of Mars have to be scaled up, um, improved to be able to land a payload, the mass of what is required for a human mission. And so it really comes down to propulsion technologies and life support technologies living on the surface and how to be able to protect our bodies against the radiation environment that we'd experience both on the interplanetary transit as well as the radiation environment on the surface of the planet. In our universe, is Mars the most 
interesting planet. In our solar system. In our solar system. It, it's, uh, it's amongst the most interesting bodies we have in our solar system because the life could actually still exist on Mars. We don't think it's on the surface, but it could live uh, perhaps uh, in, a, in a subterranean aquifer, as well as perhaps these icy moons around Jupiter and Saturn. They're equally as tantalizing in terms of their possibilities of hosting life. A frank question asked by many. What does it mean for us? For all, what does all this mean? To understand our place in the universe, how we came to be, and where we're going, at least for me. Hmm. Same thing you'd say? I would love to make contact with, with an intelligent uh, civilization to find out what do they know, what do they know about God, what happened before the Big Bang, um, how, they, how have they survived? That would be fascinating to find out. Do you think they're looking at us? Probably, probably, but they're so far away that in order to be able to send any I mean, communication somewhere to us, up there, there might be a show of guys saying, you, you, what do you want to go to Earth for? <laughs> well, they've probably received all of those old um, I Love Lucy programs over the generations say, oh, there's nothing of interest going on on <laughs> Earth. We're just going to skip it all together. <laughs> what the hell is football? <laughs> up next, what's the story behind that mysterious woman-shaped figure on Mars recently discovered? And do our scientists really believe in aliens? I think they do. Don't go away. What's this mission going in 2017? Okay, so if you loved the Kepler space mission... I love it. ...you're going to even fall more in love with the transiting exoplanet survey satellite. It's called TESS. So TESS will do basically the same thing that Kepler did, but it's going to look for planets much, much closer to Earth. So then we can follow that up with more sophisticated telescopes and study these planets and basically look for life. You wanted to correct something or add to something you said? Yeah, so the Cold Island Laboratory is the mission that we're developing at JPL. It's going to be going on the inside of the International Space Station, launching in um, early 2017, and it's an atomic physics facility, which is going to create something called an ultra-cold quantum gas, or a Bose-Einstein condensate. And the reason why we're doing it is because uh, Bose-Einstein condensate is another state of matter, which you chill it down to temperatures just above absolute zero. And at those temperatures, matter actually stops behaving like billiard balls that we're typical to seeing in, in everyday environments, but actually starts to behave like a wave. And so we'll be able to understand the quantum mechanical nature of matter at the macroscopic level. And you can only do that on space station because of the microgravity environment, which allows you to get to much colder temperatures. What's this woman-shaped thing on Mars? <laughs> I think it is probably not real. At least that's my personal opinion. And when we do take these high-resolution images of the surface, you can get shadows, which makes objects look like anything. So, for example, if you look up in the sky and see a cloud which looks like, you know, uh, the shape of an alien or something like that it doesn't make it an alien just the way it appears. So it's more of an optical illusion than a real thing. Why is Mars important? Mars is important because Mars is one of the terrestrial planets. And so the terrestrial planets are Venus, Earth, and Mars. And at the formation of the solar system, um, scientists actually believed that the planets were very similar to each other in terms of having a thick atmosphere and water on the surface. But as we know, Venus is a very hot, hot temperature planet with a very thick, dense atmosphere, uh, basically this temperature of um, a self-cleaning oven. <laughs> and um, Earth, of course, is a wonderful place that we live. And Mars is dry and dusty and has a very, very thin atmosphere and no appreciable water on the surface. So when we explore the terrestrial planets, we actually learn more about our own planet and learn about how our own planet evolved and how it may evolve to either be like Mars or be like Venus. And we also could one day colonize it and live on the surface. <laughs> Last time you were here, Nick, you said there are billions of planets out there left to be discovered. How do you know? Well, again, thanks to the Kepler Space Telescope that launched in 2009, it has looked at just a patch of the sky, just a small sliver of the galaxy, and it's concluded that, on average, Billions. every star that it looks at finds uh, it has an exoplanet around it. So if you just extrapolate that to the number of stars in the galaxy, you, you come to that same conclusion that there are not just billions, there are hundreds of billions, if not even trillions, of planets in our galaxy. Should we go back to the moon, or have we learned all there is to know? I'm not personally a fan to go back to the moon. I think we've done it. I think we understand it. I think our sights have to be set a little further, and Mars is the perfect place for that. You believe in climate change? I do believe in climate change, Can for you sure. see that happening from satellites? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Earth science, um, Earth science and observational satellites tell us what our weather is today and where things are going. So. What do you make of people who deny climate change? Oh, Larry, I'm, I'm so disappointed. It, it's not a matter of believing it, right? It's, this, is not a, this is not a belief question. It's a matter of look at the data 
interpret the data and then make some guesses of where it's leading. Look at the weather. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. you know, I think it's politicians' responsibility to, to dig into, into the data and bring that forward so the public can see it. It's not their job to close the, the conversation. What do you make of people like Scott Kelly who go up there for a year and do those things? Well, I think he's a hero, um, and I, I think he is sort of a, an ideal person in terms of, you know, as a human being as well as a scientist and as an engineer. So I think it makes um, all of us proud that we have people like that who do those things. Yeah, what do you, uh, they're, they're explorers, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. Just like Lewis and Clark, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm incredibly jealous. I you would, were, you'd like to go up? In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. I think, I think when you're in his place, he has plenty of time to think. I mean, I know NASA keeps him very busy, but he has plenty of time to look out the window. And you see life differently when you see just the, the black vastness of space. And you have to wonder, why the heck are we here? I like when he said that, when I asked him, where are you? And he hold it. Over Australia, it's nighttime. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of weird, isn't it? It really is. I think what our forefathers would have thought of that. When you look at all of this, what do you believe? Do you, what started all? What? Oh, in terms of how the universe first started? Yeah, was it? So, I mean, I, I think I do believe in the Big Bang and, and then, you know, how all the different galaxies formed and how the planets formed within that. Um, and before the Big Bang, there was nothing. Um, I think before the Big Bang, it was just a, a big ball of energy. And so it's really just a change in the energy from the state it once was, actually, to the state it is now. Do you believe so. in a creator, Nick? You know, I almost have to believe that something was behind all of this. From the Big Bang onward, physics can explain most of every day or the natural world. But what happened before the Big Bang, we have no clues whatsoever. So a creator is just as good of an explanation as anything else is. Or as George Carlin once said, who created the creator? Aha. Circular. That's how you can go nuts. Exactly. Great scene. I've got to come to the laboratory. I'll nice set that up. You. I want to thank astronaut Scott Kelly and the whole team at NASA for making today's show possible. Special thanks to Dr. Anita Sengupta and Dr. Siegler. And remember, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time up there. <laughs>